Welcome all of you to Utah. It's a real honor to be here. I had a chance to talk to Brian Haslam and some of his team behind the stage. And we're so lucky to have people like Brian who are entrepreneurial. It's the private sector that is the bread and butter of our state and people like him who are committed to making government a better place. And all of you are here because you have that same mission. So Brian told you a little bit about my job and I want to spend some time today in 30 minutes, right? What can, I thought, what can I share with them in 30 minutes? And all of my experience in government uh, from overseeing the budget and operations for the state and running multiple agencies. And at one point in my life, actually, as I was going blind, I am blind. This is not like a beauty thing. <laughs> I'm blind as a cane. I uh, was a recipient of government services. There was a point in my life when I was on Social Security disability. This was years and years ago. And I lived the bureaucracy of government from the other side. And it can be a pretty scary place as a citizen to feel like you're up against almost a behemoth. And so I, I came to this position with a lot of passion about how do we protect the taxpayer, uh, make sure that we're not extracting money that we shouldn't extract and using it very wisely. How do we provide the best benefit for the customer as well as for our employees? And in the time I have, in, I wanted to share with you my perspective that the biggest constraint we have in organizations really is our mindsets. The tools and the techniques I have not seen a system yet where we haven't been able to get 50, 25, 100%, in some cases, 300% improvement. The hidden capacity exists. And we'll talk a little bit about you know, a few insights on that. But fundamentally, if we don't start the journey with mindset, uh, the rest won't matter. So I'm going to talk today about the mindset for great leadership with some examples in my own personal life. And maybe you'll hopefully take something away from that. My perspective, there are three things that are really important great managers and leaders need to have in order to make significant change. One, the ability to set ambitious targets. Two, the belief that hidden capacity exists. And three, the ability to commit. Those sound like rhetoric, I know. I'll talk about each of these in more detail. And just know that there are actual tools we use to make these things become more than just a belief, but reality. Let me go to this first one of idea of ambitious targets. Well, the governor set up a, a target to improve government performance by 25%. That was right after the recession, where budgets had been slashed, revenue was down. And to ask our agencies to do this, from adult probation and parole, to uh, capital facilities, to you name it, state troopers, mental health hospital, we expected a 25% improvement. And that meant a lot of fear for people. Is that even possible? Ambitious targets are ambitious for two reasons. First, we are not always entirely sure how we're going to get there. If we knew how we would get there, we would already be doing it. Too often I see people creating goals that are one, not very clear, I don't even know what they're talking about, or two, they're really safe. They're in the noise of variation. And in my perspective, if you're doing anything that's two, three, five, eight percent improvement, you have not dealt with the core problem in your organization. I'll talk about that later. But I want to tell a story that has affected me every day of my life as a blind person. And I think it's affected how I approach government ops operations. So when I was first going blind, I started when I was 11, and I lost a lot more in my 20s and uh, had some interesting experiences, fell in a manhole and all this stuff. So finally I had to wake up one day and say, I got to figure out how to do my life as a blind person. I was going through the transition of sighted to blind. And I went to a residential training program, one of the best in the country. And we would wear sleep shades all day because I had a little peripheral vision. So you'd wear sleep shades all day so you couldn't cheat. And we'd have to use power saws and we'd have to do just crazy things to learn how to live independently as a blind person. And one thing we'd have to do to graduate is they would put us in a van and they would drive us, we were back in Baltimore, Maryland at the time, put us in a van and they would drive us around the city and they would drop us off and we'd have to get back to where we started, but we could only ask one question along the way. We did have a braille compass. And I say this jokingly, but seriously, my biggest thing is like, please don't drop me off near the heroin district of Baltimore. <laughs> I didn't want to wander into that. So 
every day we would train so that at the end of our training we could accomplish that task. Essentially, they could parachute us into China as a blind person, we could find our way out. Seems scary at the time, now, now no big deal. But I was training one day with my teacher to get ready for this, and I was out at a park, and the park was crazy complicated. I could not find my way through this dang park. The sidewalks twisted. I would always, every time I'd walk, I'd hit grass or dirt. I couldn't track the sidewalk, or what we call shorelining if you're a blind person, to track the, the, the line of the um, sidewalk. So finally, I just stopped moving because I didn't know what else to do. I felt stuck. And I thought, is this it? Is this how I'm going to live? My teacher came up, Tony Cobb, something that was so profound. And I, I seriously, I use this when we approach any organizational improvement. I said, Kristen, you've got to learn to walk through your confusion and your uncertainty. You've got to just learn to walk through your fear. No new information will come by standing still. The new information only comes when you take a step into the unknown. Ambitious targets by design means we are walking into territory we've never achieved. When I was talking to Brian behind the scenes, who owns this great company, his journey, he didn't know how it was all going to unfold. There had to be so much uncertainty about how he was going to pull all this off. When you set an ambitious target about the kind of specific deliverables you're going to give to your customers or your employees, it should be so ambitious, you're not sure how are you going to achieve it. I tell the governor this now, but at the time when we talked about this 25% improvement goal across all of state government, I wasn't quite sure how we were going to do that. Einstein once said, one of my favorite quotes, that we cannot solve problems at the same level of understanding we had when they were created. It does require new knowledge. Some of the most profound work I've done has been around in the theory of constraints. It's a process improvement methodology. I did not know how to do any of this 10 years ago. It was trial and error to figure this out. But we did learn that it is okay to feel uncomfortable. That in fact, the only way we're going to get really good is if you are always a little uncomfortable. And if you're not, it's probably time to kick it up a notch. So that's one reason why ambitious targets are ambitious, because we're not sure how to achieve them. The other reason why they're ambitious is as soon as we say we're going to take something big on, for example, we were just working with our state hospital. How are we going to significantly improve how people are treated and served in the state hospital with no new resources? We've now improved it by 300%. But as soon as we start that journey, it's easy to talk about as human beings, the first thing we do is go to how difficult that will be and every obstacle or problem that will be in our way. And that's not a bad thing if we can use to leverage obstacles the right way. So another interesting story for me as a blind person, a few couple of months ago, we were in San Diego on a vacation. And we were staying at Airbnb, and I love to walk. I'm fairly active and to be outdoors. So I love to go for walks. Well, this is a new neighborhood. I wasn't sure about the neighborhood. So I started off walking one block. And once I could count the blocks, I'd you know, get my circumference bigger and bigger. Anyway, I was walking, and I was coming around, and a car was parked right in the middle of the sidewalk. Are any of you those kind of people that park your car in the sidewalk? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Oh, I won't see you anyway, so it won't matter. But you may not want to be one of those people. Anyway, one of those people parked their car right in the middle of the sidewalk. So of course I found it. And at first I was so frustrated. I was like, who does this? But then I realized once I walked around the car that right after the car, was a street that I needed to turn on that would bring me back to our Airbnb. And that ended up being a great thing because sometimes when I'm walking, I lose track of where I am. I, you know, in new places, I count the blocks. But when I'm walking, I can listen to my books or be thinking about work, and you lose track of where you are. So this became what I thought was an obstacle, became this great guidepost. So as soon as I hit the car, I knew, the next street was where I turned. So now I was thinking, please, I hope they don't leave. <laughs> so what I thought was an obstacle was simply a guidepost to say is here is where you need to spend some, or uh, pay t uh, time and attention. I was just working with some folks today, this morning on tax policy. I know, super exciting. Um, and we started deliberately actually listing every obstacle that could exist in terms of making a change we need to make. And when we looked at that, all those became 
are here's great areas where we need to spend our time and attention so we can solve them. Obstacles are not hard, they're not bad. All they are are little hints and guides to us of where we need to spend time and attention so that we can solve the problems. Okay, so when we get that mindset that we can have massive improvements, we're willing to take stuff on we don't know how to achieve, we're not stupid about it, but it's uncomfortable, and we know that we can handle obstacles, that became su becomes such a strong foundation for managers and leaders to go do really important work. Okay, so the next category, right? We talked about set ambitious targets. The next one is this idea that you need to believe there's hidden capacity. Now, if you don't believe something exists, you're not gonna go look for it. I've seen a lot of organizations where out of the gate, they'll say, well, we're different, we're unique, this doesn't apply to us, or we've tried it all, or we're as busy as we can get, we have no capacity, been there, done that, excuse, excuse, excuse. Look, just because I don't see a sunset anymore does not mean a sunset does not exist. Our mindset is that every organization has massive hidden capacity. The trick is we don't know how to find it yet. We don't see it. It's hidden for a reason. Usually in government, my experience is we haven't been trained on some of the methodologies to go find and see where this capacity is. But if we just believe it's there, we'll start having the tenacity and the curiosity to go figure out how to find it rather than saying it doesn't exist. But there are three really important tactics under this concept that can help people understand that hidden capacity exists. The first one, systems thinking is really simple. It sounds great, but it's this idea that individual parts, even if you got every single individual part to work really efficiently, if they don't work together, in a system, it won't matter. So let me make this kind of real for you. I know this is an oversimplified system. I know all systems are not this easy. Although actually in government, we make things way more complicated than they need to be, and they're really not that complicated. But I have a slide, A, B, C, D, E slide. And this has basically five individuals working. And each individual has a different level of capacity, how long it takes them to do their job. So you can see numbers across each letter, right, of how much work this individual can do within an hour. So the question is, how much work can this system produce in an hour? I've got A, B, C, D, E. You don't have to actually know the answer, but I want to put 100 units of work in at the beginning of the hour. At the end of the hour, how much can that system produce? Now, before I tell you the answer, what we tend to do in government, and all organizations, I think, is we tend to try to improve every individual part. A, you can, because the reality is that waste and opportunity exists everywhere in an organization. Would you agree? You could sit down with your employees or yourselves or your managers and all of us could come up with a million things that need to be fixed. There's no lack of opportunity to improve in government. The question is where? If I do not think as a system I'm going to go try to improve A and B and C and D and E. But let me ask you this, going back, how much can this system actually produce? Who wants to guess? 10. If you said 10, the answer is right. C can only produce 10 units of work in an hour. If A can produce 500 units, it doesn't matter, because when it gets to C, C can only produce 10. And then C hands off its work to D. And it doesn't matter how much D can produce, if it could produce 1,000. It only has 10 units to work on. Same for true for E. So instead of spreading our very precious time and attention on trying to improve everything, if we first understand that we have to act as a system and understand what work is coming in and what our work is like once it leaves and goes downstream, in my perspective, that is the only way to get massive improvements in organizations. Because not only can we start improving everything but C, we can make things worse. If we start improving A and B and get tons more capacity, all we're doing is creating build-up inventory. Right? That is how we have warehouses that have to house equipment and stuff that isn't working well. This is how we get call centers. This is how we get employee burnout. This is how we have kids and child welfare investigations absolutely in backlog, which is immoral from my perspective. Not here in Utah. We do that well. 
We have to understand, number one, capacity exists when we start to think as a system. Number one. Number two, we have to learn to focus on the right problem to solve. Strategy or a change is simply exists to solve a problem. I have seen far too many organizations jump into solutions without understanding the problem. In fact, I was so curious about this, I had my team go survey a bunch of strategic plans from local government, state, federal government, and the private sector. Beautiful, cool looking strategic plans with graphics and charts and glossy paper. How many of those actually had a really clear problem? It was clear what the problem is they were trying to solve. Less than 15%. And of those, I would say half of that 15% were even valid. I know that sounds opinionated, but I feel strongly about this stuff. We, drum, we jump into solution and strategy, and we do not understand the problem we're trying to solve. In the example before, when you saw A, B, C, D, E, we first know we need to focus our time and attention on C. And then when we understand that from a systems perspective, and we understand why C is blocked and can only produce 10, and if I can get C to go from 10 to 30, because I solve the right problem, my whole system is improved by 300%. It's really that simple. Not easy, but simple. So here's the problem. When we go in to start solving problems, there's a few traps I think people can fall into. There's a bunch of things we can get into. I want to talk about just a few of them. When we start to solve problems, first of all, we ignore that the problem exists or we just assume it's obvious, right? We just believe everyone's on the same page about the real problems and we just move into change and into strategy. It's really important that we're explicit. Two, we can sometimes focus on things that are outside of our control. Especially in government, it's really easy to blame the legislature, right? or Congress, or whoever else. What's really important is that we focus on solving problems that within our sphere of influence and control. That we get our own house in order, and we are so good at what we do, then we have the street credibility to start influencing outside stakeholders. I've seen a lot of organizations, and I'll tell you, most people in government are like awesome. They come for the right reason, their hearts are in the right place. And sometimes though, we can get really frustrated and start blaming why we don't have supervisor support or why our management won't give us more money or give us our budget. And we can go on and on. But in reality, this is my belief, that we can chart our own destinies. That in fact, if you believe that the capacity to, ex to improve already exists within your sphere of control or influence, and that's where you focus, you can get so much more done versus worry about blaming other people, et cetera. Let me give you an example. A guy, Fred Kaufman, did a video, and I loved it. He did this example. If I'm holding an apple right here and I drop it, why did it fall? Gravity, and why else? I dropped it. How we define our reality matters a great deal. I prefer to focus and define my reality in terms of those things I can influence. If the legislature does not appropriate money one of our agencies asked for, my first question is maybe our presentation wasn't good enough. What are we missing and how we're trying to message what we need? It's a much happier way to live. Okay, so here's what happens when we, a couple more things about defining the right problem. You see the traps. Another one I just want to touch on that drives me crazy is sometimes in government we say the lack of something is the problem. So in Utah, we'll hear about there's a lack of teachers. That's just a byproduct. That's an indirect byproduct. Why is there a lack of teachers, right? There's a lack of money, lack of revenue, lack of buy-in. Those are only effects. Those are not the problem. One of my favorite quotes by Thoreau is, for every thousand men hacking at the leaves of evil, only one is chopping at the root. The trick when I've seen managers turn their organizations around, they understand how to think as a system, and they are crystal clear on what the problem is. And they can focus on it like nothing else. And from that comes the solution. Um, here's the challenge. When we do not understand the problem, we can jump into something what I call the seductive seven. We can jump into solution mode. From my perspective, most problems are not worth solving and most strategies we undertake do not address the right problem. Breakthrough solutions begins with a new understanding of the problem, not with a new solution or strategy. When we get the problem right, 
we're in good shape. When we don't, we can jump into the seductive seven. We can say, oh, I just need more money. I just need more data. I just need more technology. I just need more, I just blame more. I need more accountability. I need more strategic planning. I need more training. I need more reorganization. These things are not bad. In fact, they can be empowering and very helpful. But it's like a recipe. Not that I like to cook. I hate cooking. Not that I don't like food. I just don't want the cleanup. But if I were making lasagna, and I got the best noodles in the world, but the rest of my, ingredient, and my recipe was fundamentally flawed, it wouldn't matter. These things are just simply ingredients in the recipe. The recipe is really understanding your core problem of where to focus so that these tactics, these elements of your solution, workflow design, all those things, these things can come and become powerful solutions. I know this conference is looking at some amazing technology and data to really help people make smart, quick decisions, which I love. And it is a technology that is practical and works. I've seen other organizations, in contrast, spend so much time tracking so much data that they cannot hear the signal through all the noise. So be cautious if you're jumping into these things and you do not understand the problem you're trying to solve. We spend billions of dollars across this country and we, on these kind of solutions, and we do not move the needle in massive ways for the citizens we serve and for our employees. Okay, a uh, final one on this, believe. It's this idea of you have to challenge assumptions. Um, in government, everything's just made up. It's just made up. It's words on paper that people talk about. If we can make government up, we can unmake it in a legal way. I'm not saying illegally, but I am saying we can challenge every assumption that exists. To really challenge, is, it, is there a better way to do it? Is this really how it has to be? Is this the right way to do it? And this is where it becomes fun. I got to tell you this great story. Uh, one of my mentors, Dr. T uh, Fred Schroeder, he was one of my teachers when I was back doing my blind training back in Maryland. He just, he's a blind guy, has the highest expectations for blind people. And he was working before he met me as a teacher for blind students, blind kids. And he was working with a little boy named Tony at an elementary school. And Tony wanted to learn to play tag like any other little seven-year-old boy wants to play. I have two boys of my own, so this story means a lot to me. And this little boy, Tony, he came to Dr. Schroeder one day and said, I want to play tag. Can you show me how? And Dr. Schroeder went home that night and he thought and thought, how can a blind person play tag? And he just really ruminated about this. And he came to the conclusion that, yes, blind people can do many things. But on this one, Tony was going to have to sit out. He just couldn't think of a way to play tag. And that would make sense, right? I mean, many of us would say, well, yeah, you can't play tag if you're blind. He went to the school the next day, and, um, but for the grace of God, right, before he could say anything, Tony spoke, and he was so excited, and he said, Dr. Schroeder, I figured this out. He had gotten little jars, uh, like little plastic jars, and put pebbles in them, and had handed all of those out to his friends, and they agreed on a flat place where they could run, so he could just hear his friends, as long as the friends didn't cheat, he could hear the friends rattle the jars, and he could play tag with his friends. Tony did not believe if it was possible. He assumed it was possible, and he simply asked the question, how? The difference between if something is possible versus how it is possible, that mindset can make all the difference between you're taking your organization to modest, fine, okay, in the noise, acceptable improvement to being the top in the country. When you always believe that the thing is possible and you just haven't figured out the answer yet. When, again, I hear Brian's story of creating this amazing company, he just always seems to have assumed like it could be done. You hit an obstacle. You see it as a guidepost. You challenge the assumption of why it's blocking you. You find the solution and you move on. That mindset makes all of the difference between the managers I've experienced who can turn their organizations around and those who give up. They have the Tony mindset. Okay, so final quick slide on this is this idea that commit. That sounds obvious, right? 
I was listening to a guy the other day on a podcast. I was so impressed. He was talking about when he first started his business years and years and years ago, nobody believed in his business. He told them, if you come here to test out what I do, I will pay for your airfare and I will take your check of $1,500 and you don't have to pay me any money and only at the end do you have to pay me because I so believe that you'll love this. And if you don't like it, I'll pay your airfare and this whole thing was free. Talk about commitment. Like talk about skin in the game. Commitment is really, are you willing to put yourself out on the line and go out on an ambitious target and really commit your heart and soul to achieving that even if you may fail and be embarrassed and not achieve it? I mean, that's the kind of commitment it takes because there will be obstacles, there'll be naysayers, there's going to be political hurdles, there'll be technology problems, there'll be money problems, there'll be employees that don't buy in. The obstacles are endless. And yet, if you're committed, you will have the persistence and the stamina to overcome the obstacles that will come your way as you go for these kind of massive improvements in your organizations. Part of commitment, when we talk to our organizations, is if you're really committed to Thing, to an ambitious target, and the ambitious target is so important because it pulls you in the direction you need to go, and it filters what you should do and what you shouldn't do, what's important and what's not important. The most important thing in starting this is to stop what is not going to help you achieve your target. We're all very busy. I don't care. I look at organizations and I'm like, you can stop 50% of the junk you're doing and you won't even notice because it's getting you nowhere. Big improvements begin when we stop doing the things that aren't helping us achieve our target, which frees up capacity so we can begin the things that will. And that can feel scary because we want to start a lot of things and work on a lot of things and be responsive and have a lot of things in the pipeline, but to say no, I will focus only on the changes that will help me get to my ambitious target is scary. When I started to learn to ski, I remember my, I, I skied forever and then I went not skiing for like 10 years and went back up, started skiing again about 10 years and I got back into my boots and I was leaning, any of you skiers? Yeah, like you know how you're supposed to lean forward? So I was leaning way back in my boots on my skis, which is not the way to ski. And my instructor said, you've got to lean in to your boots. You've got to lean in. And it felt so scary because I felt when I was leaning in, I was leaning into the mountain and I was going to go full tilt, downhill, out of control. And by the way, I use a ski guide. They tell me left, right. So I'm not skiing solo. Don't worry about that. But I, um, he said, Kristen, you've got to lean in. And that leaning in is what committed me to start moving down the mountain and that's what actually gave me the control, because then I could move my skis back and forth. Leaning in and committing and putting so much skin in the game that it means it could hurt if you fell, I think is what it really takes to achieve big stuff. If you're playing it safe, you'll get modest results. But skin in the game means if you fell, it could hurt. And when you're that committed that it could hurt if you fell, you'll find the tenacity to figure this stuff out. At the end of the day, I'll close with this. I am honored every day to work with amazing people across this state who show up for work every day to make a difference. We have one of the best states in the country. If you're from other states, sorry to say that. We've got a great state. And there's lots of challenges in government. Uh, you guys live it, right? You've got a million stakeholders down your back. You've got the governor's office in your face. You've got legislators. You've got local city council. You've got special service. You've got customers. You've got employees. You just have so many people like wanting stuff. The trick in government is to be able to calm your systems down and to see through all the noise and chaos in your systems clearly so you know the very few things that you can do to get the biggest amount of change. And I believe... Absolutely, after working in over 150 major systems across government, across this country, every system, every system can achieve massive improvements, but it begins with the whole idea if you believe it's possible. All right, with that, I wish you all the best with your time here at this great conference and enjoy our state. Thank you so much.